buffering. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Q&A and critique number 64. It is currently 1517 local time or 2017. Yes, I am running very late and my publicity was pushed up last minute, but I managed to fulfill one of the things that I had in my to do list, which was to make a video announcement. So if you want to check out the video announcement of the topic of today, you can on YouTube. And yes, we are live right now, but without further ado, I guess that allows us to begin better late than never. So I'm here in the voice chat in the B4Artist Discord server with Killen and Plebs. Thank you for joining today and having faith in the event to make sure that it's happening. And I have a very cool topic that um, a good friend, Barella, has... Um, had me do and something that I worked all this weekend doing with some weapons that I developed for uh, with a rebake and a retopology for unity so the whole package was about 340,000 triangles and I retopologized it to be 90% or oh, to save 90% of the weight to be only 34,000 triangles for the whole entire pack which was a, a weapon pack of about 12 models so I would like to share this workflow with you and then we're going to cover um, a little bit for, of the techniques that we learned from last week using bendy bones with a little added bonus of animation. So Plebes and Killin, are you guys ready? I think so. All right. All right. Good. So um, Killin, I saw in your uh, tw Twitter feed that you had a um you were developing a sculpt of an alien and from scott ridley and you started using bendy bones on him how did it go well i haven't bendy bones just yet um those were just that was just like one bone of like a regular armature um i was going to do the bendy bones uh next on stream and get it all set up and put that for the tail and get something for the face too but uh, yeah, sorry, no, that wasn't quite the bendy bones just yet. But it was close. Close, yeah. Close enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty funny to see it thrash. Thank you. But um, yeah, head, let's see if we can run that. Say that again? Headbanging is such a fun and simple animation. That's right. Okay. So, um... Plebs, I know you've worked with some pretty high poly photo scans before, so I wanted to ask you, uh, have you managed to do any retopology on photo scans before? No. No. Oh, okay. Well, today's your lucky day. All right. So what I did today, I'll just give you a quick outline, is we're going to take this bird, which I found as a CCO asset on Sketchfab, Oh, and it's now really yeah it's a very nice bird what is that bird and so um this was from sketchfab you can download it for free and what we're going to do is we're going as you can see the topology is ridiculously high and because it is so high my performance with the animation is going to be low uh, ideally i would like 30 frames per second to have a very nice smooth animation while i animate and while i rig so it's better to have less topology and work from there. Another reason why we could do uh, not be able to use a photo scan is sometimes if you have, for example, one million triangles or one and a half million triangles on a cliff face, and then you want to decorate the entire scene with trees and a character and everything else, uh, there's a possibility that you're going to hit a memory cap first on your video card and then on your computer as you load up every, all of the geometry onto the card or onto your RAM sticks. And this often can slow down your renders, make them unstable, especially if you're rendering for animation. And it's just all around not a fun experience to work with such a laggy viewport, laggy software, or just laggy workflows as you lay out your scenes and light them and set them up for rendering. If you make something have less topology, so for example, I'm not going to zoom into this animation up to this level. I'm not going to be able to see the reflection in the eye. I'm not going to be looking at the beak. 
and the resolution even doesn't allow for this. So my animation is going to be about this far away, which means all of this topology is not necessary. The same as when you have, for example, uh, retopology or a topology of a photo scan. You have a mountain in the far away distance, or you have a cliff that's only taken a quarter of the space of the screen. In this case, you have 192, 1920 pixels wide, 10,000 or 1080 uh, tall, which means you don't need one tiny pixel uh, uh, polygon per pixel. You could work with something with a lot less resolution and still get away with murder. So let's begin. First, we're going to retopologize it. Then we're going to have to bake the high quality textures to the low quality model, which means we're going to have to quickly UV unwrap it and use some add-on or something because the blender native baking is terrible don't use it you'll be frustrated to then bake the high quality textures from the photo scan to the low poly model and then from there we'll quickly make a bendy bone rig and do a quick little animation so let's begin so here's the photo scan most often than not you start with a photo scan and it's made out of multiple pieces so it's best to join them together and then from there, just do a heal. So when you heal, this is underneath mesh. I think it's underneath dissolve. No, not dissolve, clean up, merge. Merge by distance. So the merge by distance or healing it makes sure that all the vertices that have been repeated or the faces that are floating stick together. So it's all one mesh. So now we have all the meshes together. And this is good to go. I'm going to clear the transform from its parents because Sketchfab has two nulls for some strange reason. And then from there, this is pretty much at the center of the world. Make sure we've reset the transform, clear the transform, which is underneath object, clear location. And from there, so it's at the center of the object, at the center of the world, ready for the baking. So the quick and easy and dirty way of retopology, there are two methods. One of them is hand retopologized models specifically designed either for hard surface or for character models. This type of topology requires a lot of time and effort because it is specifically done to create animatable loops of topology so that your meshes deform correctly. With this particular mesh, since this is going to be a relatively simple animation, I'm going to make him look around and maybe bob up and down or something or shake his head. Maybe rustle his feathers. Um, that's all he's going to do. So in this case, I don't need amazing topology. So I just need to save topology. So let's go into the modifier stack. And we're going to use... What do you guys think? Which modifier will help us reduce topology in a nice clean way? Uh, Geo nodes merge by distance. <laughs> Geo nodes merge by distance, which is the same as welding by distance. We could also use the weld here. I always forget about that. So, but first we might actually use a decimate node. The decimate node is one of my favorite for retopology, especially quick and dirty ones. I like to use a planar retopology. So, what planar does is it basically, whatever face is flat, it's going to make it flat. And this is going to be based on an angle. Obviously, it's going to look terrible. But that's the first step that I usually do. Then from there, I decimate and collapse. And when I collapse, I use a ratio of like 0 0.2 to keep it under like 20%. So now we've got the flat faces, the 20%. Maybe we can drop it to 10%. Let's get, pull up our statistics. We're at 10,000 faces. Perfect. Then from there, we're going to do some cleanup. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to triangulate. Because we're going to use this for animation for later. And just to make sure the normals are okay. Beauty is fine. And now it's at 10,000. So if we hide all of the operators, 
The original was at 149,000 tries. Whew, quite heavy. Typically, you usually want character rigs to be at max 100,000, generally. So in this case, we use the modifier stack, nice and quick, and we're already down to 10,000. Perfectly usable for a game. Or for a quick animation. And this is what we're going to work with. So, once we have those three modifiers, they decimate by planar, so that we have some kind of loop flow. Decimate by collapsing on the edges with a percentage, which is similar to weld by distance. And then we triangulate. I'm going to keep the normals as well. Turn on triangulate, keep normals. And with that, we're going to apply all the modifiers. In native Blender, I don't actually remember how to apply all the modifiers, but what I usually do is I use this add-on called the modifier list, which adds me the has the ability to show hide all modifiers, delete all modifiers, apply all of them instead of one by one. And quick, you also have like a search and different type and the panel, you can either have the panel inside the modifier stack or in the property shelf. So now we have a model, but if we take a closer look, we have lost or we have screwed up the UVs. Uh, so this is a problem. And this is where we need to do some baking. So today, we're going to be taking a look at an add-on called Easy Baker. So Easy Baker by Aquatic Nightmare. This add-on, which I'm going to add inside of the chat, so you can take a look. This is my favorite baking add-on. The reason why is um, I'm going to use the developer build. The reason why I love this add-on is because I can plug in Marmoset, I can plug in Hand Plane Baker, and I can use Cycles Baking, I can use Batch Baking, and I can visualize the cage, and I can bake multiple maps at the same time at a single click of a button. And it bakes in the background, so it doesn't freeze up Blender as it bakes. So you can keep on working, you can keep doing your work while it's baking. And since Cycles is very slow at baking, well, you can save time, but you can also plug in Marmoset or you can plug in Hand Plane, which is another free add-on. If you go to handplane3d.com, uh, you can download this uh, nifty little free software to bake normals, curvature maps, thickness maps, and a couple of others, ambient occlusion, in a matter of milliseconds. It's absolutely beautiful. And this plugs directly inside of your software, and you can start working from there. So, let's take a look. The first things we need to do to get ready to bake, is we need to name our objects correctly. So here's the bird, we're going to call this one low, underscore low. And the other one, we're going to call this bird, underscore high. And also we just need to make sure the UVs are okay. So as you can see, the UVs are screwed up. There's a big spider web here. So I'm just gonna quickly unwrap. So UV, smart UV project, let it do its job. And then from there, I'm going to use the UV packer, which is a very another free add-on, which is really good for packing UVs. UV packer blender add-on, where is it? Let's see if I can find it. So hand plane is the other baking system that I have. UV packer dot UV uh, hyphen, I think it is. Packer.com. This is my favorite UV packing software. It's free and it's a very good one. And very fast. The alternative is using uh, UV Pack Master, but you do have to pay for that one. This one is free. So you just let it pack, does the job, and as you can see, we have now 69% of the surface covered inside of the topology, and everything's okay. Except, it doesn't look good. <laughs> but we repacked everything, and it's all fine now. So if we go into the material, so these are the things we need to cover. First things first, you need to make sure your uh, names are correct. Bird high for the high poly and bird underscore low for the low poly. 
So we have the high poly, which is this, and then we have the low poly. The second thing is we need to make sure the UVs are good on the low poly one. If we have no UVs, it will not bake. The next thing after that, we have to make sure it has a unique material for that particular um, burr creature, for example. So I'm going to call this T for underscore, which is the Unreal Engine standard for naming your textures. Bird, and that should be good enough. And with that, there's a couple of uh, topology issues, which I don't like here, but um, I just kind of go to my mesh, merge at center, good. There are a couple of issues that usually it's better to use something else for retopology in this case, or, or even you could use um, the remesh modifier with a voxel remesh or others, or even in the sculpt mode, you can use another, the remesh option of a voxel remesh doesn't really matter. If you do, here's another option, if you do do a voxel remesh, as you can see I lost a lot of detail, so I'll just use it like this. If you do do a remesh, it's good to use a shrink wrap modifier on top of your high poly and then apply the shrink wrap. The shrink wrap will help you reshape the remesh, which you sometimes loses shape onto your original mesh. That's another little tip. So now we're good. We've got bird high, bird low, and we have the T-bird as a unique material on the low. So now let's go to the add-on. So I'm gonna make this panel bigger so you can see what's going on. You have this uh, general settings add-on, which has the names that it detects. You have bakers, so you need to create a new baker. Once we create a new baker, the other panels start to fill up. Bake groups, and maps, and output. So here in the um, baker settings, you have three options. The marmoset tool bag, the hand plane, or blender. In this case, we're going to use blender for now. And we're going to bake it just to 1K, so it's nice and quick. We're going to use the GPU. I'm going to pick a folder. So let's go here, inside of my sub-projects of my social uh, scenes, Q&A, Q&A number 64, and just call this one pictures, and inside here I'm going to use this folder, I'm going to give a padding of about two pixels, no, four pixels, and then from there I need to add a bake group. So when you have the correct naming, this add-on will detect the bake groups of as many objects as you want. So you can add one, you can add any others, you can add a custom one, and you're good to go. So you can add as many models as you want that you want to bake one after the other. So it has batch baking. And also I want to give a warm welcome to Matt. Hello. So now Hello, that... hello. Hey. Okay. So if you um I didn't notice that you came in earlier. I hope you've been uh, watching the beginning so far. I just popped in. Oh, that's good. So basically, I'll give you a quick rundown. Lately, we've been using a photo scan of this bird, which is a very high poly bird. Um, so we can't use this to animate. So I gave a quick little tip on how to use modifiers to quickly retopologize a bird. So now it is uh, slightly more manageable for a rig to quickly animate but we lose the UVs and we lose the textures so I'm sharing a very cool add-on which is one of my favorites for baking inside blender or be for artists so that um, it becomes a lot easier to bake what you need to bake so we're at the step of setting up the bake so from there we can use this magic one button this means this creates a cage this, um, this cage visualization helps us visualize um, at what angles or how far away are the rays of from the bake and to make sure there are no intersections. We can show and hide this whenever we want. From there, we can start choosing the maps. So we're going to choose the normals and we're also going to... I probably should analyze the material of the actual high poly model to see what we want to bake. So we have a base color, 
and we have an emission color. Okay, and there's just the one texture. That's fine. That's got some color attributes. So it looks like we just need to bake the emission and we're good. <laughs> nice and easy. So if we go inside the UV editing again, what we can do is we can add a map. We can choose the alpha base color and from there we just want the base color or the emission. So the emission is fine. May as well bake the normals as well. If you're using the developer build, you get to choose how many samples you want. For most of these maps, it's perfectly fine to use what you already have. And then we're good to go. So now that you have as many models as you want, the render settings, the file format, the resolution, the folder, the, the baking that you want, you can use hand plane, which bakes in uh, normals and curvature in milliseconds. Marmoset does a similar thing, curvature and convex, and then you hit the bake button. So as you can see, it's starting to run up Blender, and now it is baking. As you can see, it can still work, but if I look at the console, you can see that it is currently baking. And that's the power of Easy Baker. Many other bakers do not have this. Usually you have to sit and wait. And if you don't have a powerful computer, cycles takes a very long time. So let's go to our low poly model and let's start adding in the textures. So let's load them up. Are you following so far? I think so. All right. Do you have questions about Easy Baker thus far? Yeah, it seems pretty, uh, pretty uh, easy to use. That's good. Yeah, it's one of my favorite bakers, so. because it is easy to use. <laughs> it's one of the reasons. So here are the textures. So we got the normals and we got the bird. So we got the high poly normals and the low poly thing. So let's uh, go into shading. Uh, let's pick this bird here, load in the normal, load in the material, plug this into the base, not the alpha. Color to base. And plug in the normals. So we just need to grab the normal map. Normal map, normal. Oops. The vector, normal map. Plug that in, plug that in. Non color, should be fine. So as you can see, now we have this low poly model with the identical UVs, well, the new UVs, but with the actual material that we baked from the high poly to the low poly. And we've also added the ability to, for example, copy the normals from the high poly. So really exaggerated, you can see that the normals from the high poly are preserved onto the low poly, which uh, helps you to preserve detail. So normals are an incredible uh, tool for keeping your detail from your high poly photo scans onto something that is low poly. And that's where the magic happens. Another thing we can do is we can get a separate node, separate color. We can get the RGB, uh, the rod that we could use this for example in a roughness and we can use like the green channel or something into the specular or something like that to get some really cheap <laughs> looking uh, specular highlights and things like that that kind of adds a little bit of uh, sheen onto the feathers just a little bit maybe a bit too much if there's too much you can use like a math node or something so let's do that quickly math add whoops math not vector math math add normal math we'll add that into the color make it a bit rough more rough Rotate the view, maybe it's a bit too rough, and we're good to go. So now that we have this bird, we've got low poly, we biked from the high poly to the low poly, we've got the photo scan details more or less, you can see that the ruffles of the feathers that preserve that detail relatively well, and we've and we saved 90%, 95% percent of the topology weight on from this particular model ready to rig. 
So let's start rigging. Looks great. Okay. So from last week, since you're here, this is kind of a bit like a free tutorship, I suppose. Uh, what do you remember about Bendy Bones? Anything? By the way. There was a lot. It's uh, hard to pick something out. Like you have some controllers on different levels and a lot. That's right. One well, of the first things we need to do is we need to create an armature. So that's in the add armature single bone. If you have the add on, you can add a bendy bone. <laughs> Save time. Um, so this was an add on I mentioned from last week. So we can just do that actually. It will cause an error if you have 3.4 or 8. But with this bendy bone, we can use this as like a basis for what we want to work. So with the bendy bone, if you look at the, the structure, remember you start at the head, which is the father of the bone, which is the bendy bone. In this side, the bendy bone settings, you set your segments, and then you have a tail. So the head and the tail, they usually should be a part of the parent. So this is going to, I'm going to use this bone as the parent. In the armature settings, it's always good to turn on names while you're building your rigs and in front. So now that we have names and in front, we can call this the root. The root of all evil. No, sorry. <laughs> so this is going to be what I'm going to use as the branch. I'm going to extrude out another bone from here. And I'm going to call this one the branch. So now that we have the branch OK, I'm going to use, um, I'm going to move these bones, whoops, all of these three bones, and I'm going to parent the head and the tail to the branch. So armature, make a parent, control P because I use this a lot, keep offset. And now in the side view, whoops. Let's grab these three bones, I'm going to rotate them, and let's think about this a little bit. So I need three bendy bones. I need one for the body. Uh, maybe I'll use just a, a solid bone for the head. So I'm going to just copy this bone and move it around for the head like this. And to use the bone roll to set it up more nice like this. So this is going to be my head. The head pivot, maybe you're at the base of the neck like this. I'm going to use the body with the, like this bendy bone control. And then I'm going to copy the tail because I want the tail to rustle onto the tail here. But this time I'm going to rotate it around like this. And let's do some parenting. So this tail bone, which should be over here like that. As you know, you need to parent the head and the tail to the same parent. So he's going to be here. Keep offset. And I'm going to parent the head, let's just call this the head, onto the tail of this one. Keep offset. So now if we go into the pose mode, if I move the head, it moves the tail like this. If I move the tail of the middle bendy bone, it moves the head. And then I can rotate the head like this. Hello, Pose. Oh, and Shmuel. Nice that you guys could join. And if I move the branch, it moves the whole bird like this. So that's a very nice and simple rig. Let's just make sure the positions of the bones and things are in the right place. Oh, good enough. Let's just start from there. So the head. The things that we need to do now is just make sure that the bone settings, the deformers are correct. So the green one needs to be a deformed bone. And everything else, this branch needs to be a deformed bone. The root needs to be a deformed bone as well. And the head needs to be a deformed bone. This means when we do an automatic weight to this, 
So we do control P or parent with automatic weights. It will only weight to those deformer bones, but not the control bones. Uh, this is important before you do this. So you click on automatic weights. And now if we move, go into pose mode. And if we move the tail, the bird is now moving. So here it is. We got an animatable uh, bird. He's stuck on a stick. Now let's move the tail a little bit. <laughs> Not that it will move around a crazy amounts like this, but maybe it will a little bit. Or maybe we can move the branch. There you go. So now we got a quick little bird who's ready to animate and do something interesting. So let's uh, quickly review what we have just done. First things first, is we downloaded a photo scan. So if we take a look at the original photo scan, the photo scan is a high poly mesh, which looks like this. So this high poly mesh is extremely dense with textures. It's not gonna be very easy to animate with. So what we did is we used the decimate modifier with planar, decimate with collapse, then we used a, a weld modifier and also a triangulate modifier to help clean things up. The weld modifier would have uh, collapsed some things that have been, uh, for example, in our low poly one, would have collapsed some of the geometry that's very close to each other. And then from there, we went from 150,000 triangles to about 10,000 triangles, good enough to animate. And then we used a very simple uh, bendy bone from the bendy bone add-on and created uh, a basic rig to start animating. And before we started the rig, we also did some quick and easy dirty UV map unwrapping and we used an add-on called UV Packer and Smart UV Project to quickly UV this in a couple of seconds and pack it very nicely. And then we use the add-on Easy Baker to set up a bake with Blender, which baked two maps at the same time. You may ask, why didn't I bake using the native Blender baking system? Mainly because you can only bake one map at a time, one model at a time, to one texture that you have to have selected in the shader editor, or else it won't work. And the texture, you have to save it manually it won't write it to disk so the blender method of baking is absolutely a chore so use the add-ons if you can find one it will help you save a lot of time and also on top of that this add-on giving you the ability to plug into hand plane and marmoset gives you the ability to bake for example um, you could bake uh, your Bent normals, concavity, convexity, height, you know, uh, normals, positions, your thickness, your UVs, your group, group IDs, your wireframes, all of this in a matter of seconds instead of minutes if you don't have the hardware. But if you do have the hardware, well, Cycles is great. <laughs> it does the job. And now from that, we use bendy bones, a quick little spine bone, a tail bone, it's a couple of branches with FK ready to animate. And now we're going to animate it. So, you guys ready to do that? It's just fun. I have a question about Easy Baker. Is it also possible to um, bake procedural materials? Yes. Yes. Right. Um, for example, if you plug in your procedural material into your uh, principled BSDF, so basically um, it bakes the principled BSDF or emission or whatever colors that you need. So, if, we, if you have your add on, uh, or your maps. Let's take a look at the maps here. We have alpha. So this will bake the alpha channel from the PBR. Base color. This will bake the base color of the PBR in, as if it was um, affected to the PBR material. It will be a bit darker. Ah uh, no, it's uh, like an emission. It will bake the diffuse, which is set up by the light and affects your specular and metallicity. So if something's more metallic, your diffuse will be darker based on the PBR principles. Um, it will bake your glossiness, which is the same as specular. It will bake your metallic, which is the same as the metallic. 
it will make your roughness, which is the same as the roughness channel, and your subsurface color is the same as subsurface color, and then transmission color is the same as transmission. The thickness and position, these are like uh, different properties which are material agnostic, but more about geometry. UV and UV layout is a similar system, and shadow is when you bake the lights into your materials, which is something that you would want to do, for example, um, relighting a bake for and then removing those lights so that it becomes more performant. But this is for heavier scenes or baking your global illumination or things like that. So you set your procedural material to the PBR <laughs> and it will bake. And if I would want to bake translucency, I would just plug it into the subsurface and then bake it as subsurface because it doesn't matter. Yep. And your translucency right. property, for example, the radius and the subsurface power, this is a, this is shader, this is texture agnostic to some degree. But if you, for example, have like, for example, a different color map for the shader subsurface radius, you can plug it into an emission node or into the emission here and bake the emission and change the name of the file. So right now, for example, the emission channel, this could mean you could bake multiple times, but you could have as many types of uh, bakers that you want. So you could have the baker for diffuse, for the PBR, baker for the emission, and in the emission, you could plug in your material to the emission channel, and then in the emission channel, you can call this the transmission color, and it will write the file with that particular suffix. So if you have like a custom map that you want to bake, just plug it into the emission and bake the emission, and you're good to go. Great. Excellent. All right, so how much time do we have left? We're nearly done. Have you guys animated characters or animals before? Not animals, no. And have you done like a, a concept of a, have you tried to animate uh, characters before? I've done some character animations, yeah, but like not much. All right. So have you covered the principles of animation to some degree, the six big ideas or the 12 principles? I've watched YouTube videos, but never actually did anything. Okay. I've, uh, I've seen an Ego Raptor video once, and like, so I feel like I know everything now. <laughs> All right. Okay, well, let's, let's do a quick little animation here, nice and quick. So basically, what I'm going to do is at the beginning of the animation, I just record the whole character. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make this an extreme pose. And then at the end of the animation, which is going to be about here, about one second later, I'm going to just make another extreme pose. So in this case, just going to rotate the bird around. Whoa. Maybe, yeah, ro I should probably focus on the rig a bit more. Make the pose turn its head like this and lift its tail up a little bit like this so this is going to be my extreme pose and I can use this pose to as like two different extremes so when you use blender you can tag your keyframes so that you can remember what they are and when you animate so now that we have these two frames, if I change them to constant easing, so here in constant interpolation, we have one pose, and then we have the other pose. So first pose, second pose, first pose, these are the extremes, extreme keyframes. And then the next thing after that is we need to start thinking about blocking the animation. So in this case, for example, I can go to my pose settings in my in-between settings and I could like a or hair breakdowner and I can choose like blend the frame 
and or not or bring it back a little bit like this and I can uh, use the principles of animation to start planning how the animation is so while he is like turning his head he brings his head down like this pulls his tail in a bit pulls it in like this and then when that is uh, set up this frame here so it's up at the top brings down and then it brings up here so in this case we've got the storing of the energy where this is where you have to have anticipation where you store energy on the movement store energy and then it pushes up and then from there because animation is based on physics we often have to use the principles of follow through so it goes up here and maybe we'll have a frame i'll just copy this frame so it goes back to where it should be but in the middle of this movement i'm going to use the push tool and well or no i'm gonna to have to do it manually i'm just going to push his head up a little bit tilt his head up a tiny bit pull his tail up a little bit flick it up whoops pull his tail up a little bit and like flick it up so that when I pull it preserves the energy and then pulls up and then it kind of like goes up a little bit and then he relaxes so this frame here what I could do is just relax a little bit like this bring his head down in a slightly different pose and bring his body down so if we press play it goes down and then he goes up and we'll just hold the last frame a little bit more. And maybe then pull it out here. Whoops, select everything. And then pull it out. So it goes up and then down. So sparrows, all these birds, they usually move very quick. Actually, I don't like the head tilt too much. So that's the basics of getting your blocking done. So once you have your blocking done, you've got your key poses here. First pose, second pose, resting pose at the end. So this resting pose, I'll just call this like a moving hold or something. And we've got the key moments. So th after that, we need to think about arcs. So when he does this, he goes down a little bit and then he goes to here. We got to make sure that the movement is like an arc. So his head, if we think of his eye, it's going like in a zigzag moment, right? It goes down, then up. So his eye goes down and then up. So with animation, we need to make sure that the arcs are very clear. So from here, here to here, we need to make sure we can like switch this to spline by going into the interpolation busier. And if we press play, it looks very robotic. And let's make all of it spline. Whoops, here, busier. So it goes down and then up again. It kind of works, but it's not quite how I wanted it. So in this case, we got to think of like the spline movement. So we got to make sure that the curves are nice and clear. So in this case, I'm going to make this keyframe a breakdown. So it goes down and make sure this type, these keyframes are auto clamped. That's better. Auto clamp just makes them a bit smoother. So it goes down. And then I need to make sure his body down it curves, keeps on curving. And then goes up, goes up, so it curves out to the side here. And then goes up, and then he holds. And then it comes around, and down like a circle, and back down again. But a bit after everything else. Obviously you need to like think about everything, all of the pieces, make sure that the curves are fine. And make sure your timing is okay. So right now my timing, 
I want. He's taking way too long to bring his head up and around. So I'm going to grab these frames, or these frames. I squish them down, bring them in. So when he's over here, whoop. Hold it. So maybe he holds his head there for a bit longer. And then very quickly, he brings his head in a faster way. Whoop. And then we can use these frames and space them out a bit better. And with that you can work, that's the general process of how to do the animation. And with some of these frames, so for example, the body, he's leading with the head. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab all of these keyframes, scale them out and move them. So this is the next step. So you convert it to spline, you've done your blocking, you've got your extremes. So extremes first, then you do your blocking to make sure that your movement has your arcs, the anticipation, the follow through, the squashing and stretching and all of those physics. And then you convert to spline to make it smooth. You see that it's really bad, then you start fixing the <laughs> typically because the computer is not very good at that. And then you convert it to spline. So whoop. The tail is a bit slow, so I'll just go to this tail here. And I want it to hold. And this bone here probably shouldn't pop around so much. Maybe I'll get rid of this extreme. this bone here, store the energy a bit longer, and there we go, more or less. More or less. This bone here floats around too much. So I can bring it down. Now the blocking stage is really important with your animation because the better your blocking is, the easier it will be once it's smooth. Once you have your blocking nice and clear, then you can work it out a bit better. And let's give it a bit more personality. Yeah, that was kind of cool. And the way this body moves is a bit crazy. Let's just smooth it down. Yeah, that animation's looking really good. This kind of has a weird wobble. And he brings his body forward, so I think I'll go from here and brings his body forward and just I'll move that forward just a bit. And then it goes back. So there we go. This is a rough animation, so let's just press play. And he sits there. Yeah, that's about it. Two seconds. Two seconds of animation. So just to uh, cover everything we've done today, this is the close of the Q&A. 
Uh, we've covered quick read topology of the photo scan, joining the, uh, the meshes together, easy baker, UV packer, quick UV unpacking for you, um, quickly baking your meshes, setting up the bakes, doing the bakes. From there, quick wig using bendy bones, uh, using the bendy bone add-on to save time and rig together.